Ryan, for the first time in his career, Connor McDavid doesn't get a shot on goal in game one, and you predicted early this guy's going to be shot out of a cannon in game two, and it, it certainly looked like that along with Leon Dreisaitl playing as, uh, as Robin to Batman. Real uh, a limb I was standing on suggesting yeah. McDavid was going to bounce back and have a big... I mean, it's what he does, right? It's very seldom that McDavid would put back-to-back -back quiet nights together, let alone in the playoffs. Uh, but on this night, Farhan, he really came out and took the onus. I, I definitely noticed at first shift... Leon Dreisaitl will set him up off the rush on the very first shift. He tried to uncork a one-timer from the high slot. That tells you that Connor McDavid is thinking, shoot. And he ended up with nine shot attempts on the night. He was all over the ice. That line was absolutely dominant. But the thing for me, Farhan, for Leon Dreisaitl to come in and play less than 100%, and he was playing on the wing tonight because they were kind of protecting him a bit rather than playing him at center. So they put him on McDavid's wing thinking that would be an easier workload for him. Well, I mean, Leon Dreisaitl, talk about an easy workload, 27.05 tonight, and he was fantastic. He's done this before. Yeah. He had that high ankle sprain a couple years ago and was unreal in the playoffs. So Dreisaitl and McDavid drove this thing. That five-man unit with Hyman, Ekholm, and Bouchard, that five-man unit won this team this game. Yeah, when you look at the numbers when McDavid's line was on the ice, 18-1 to 1 in terms of scoring chances advantage, 9-1 to 1 in terms of high danger. And in the third period, they really tilted the ice, 15-2 to 2 with the shots on goal. And again, the scoring chances were one-sided in the third as well. And look, if I'm the Canucks, you know these guys are good. And you've seen them before, and they've taken over games before. And yes, it was a, it was a tall task for JT Miller and Brock Besser and Pia Suter and that line. And then in the second half of the third period in overtime, you saw some Elias Pettersson as they reunited the lotto line. And talking to JT Miller after the game, and he just said, we didn't win any puck battles in the offensive zone. We were one and done too often, and we let them come out with speed, and we just need to do our part in the offensive zone and try to get some touches and generate some chances. And really, I don't think it was just limited to the offensive zone. I asked Rick talking about this after the game, and their inability to exit the puck. And I think when the dry sidle McDavid line was going, I do think it carried over at other times because I think against every line, Vancouver, which has been a good puck possession team, a good team at exiting their zone, when they got pressure and when that first pass up the wall got taken away, there was panic. And talk it talked about how they flipped the puck out. They didn't want to play with the puck. And that was evident. And that has to change for Vancouver because I believe if you're going to load up that top line, I think Vancouver can have some advantages. I think the Elias Lindholm home line with Joshua and Garland against whoever Edmonton's going to throw out as a second line, say the Nugent Hopkins line. I think Vancouver can win that matchup. And if Elise Pedersen's going to be matched up with the bottom six, he finally got on the scoreboard tonight, Elise Pedersen needs to yeah. win that matchup. And I, I do think that the orders need a little bit more from their depth players moving yeah. forward. Like it was so top heavy tonight in the performance. Not that they were bad, but it, it definitely wasn't uh, anywhere near the same hemisphere. So I think there's room for growth, you know, in their, their third and fourth lines for sure. But what's the difference, though, Farhan? So the Canucks win five games in a row against the Oilers, and there isn't a McDavid performance like we saw tonight in any of those games. No. So what changes? How does that all of a sudden happen? Is it that the Canucks do something different, or is it that Connor McDavid went nuclear and arrived? And I tend to think it's a little bit more the latter. For sure. And I think that's going to provide an issue for the Canucks because McDavid is capable of this level. They're going to have to figure out a way how to handle this Connor McDavid because this Connor McDavid is likely to show up for the next game. Well, look, uh, again, like the best of Connor is the best of is better than anything the Canucks have to throw at him. There's no doubt about that. However, I do believe that if they do load up, the Canucks can have advantages, like I said, on those other lines. And, you know, so obviously they're going to need to simplify a little bit and try to eke out a greasy road win, as they like to say. And the other thing in this game, I think they wasted a really good goaltending performance by Archer Shilov. You talked about McDavid bouncing back. I think the Canucks goaltender did too, because I thought there was a chance if Vancouver lost this game, they might turn to Casey to Smith going back to Edmonton. He's won two games there this season. He's a good option. And Shilov hasn't had a heavy workload. Maybe you give him a one-off, but I thought he bounced back really well, earned the start. Not in game on him. Three. Like no, no. Not at all. I mean, and you, that game-winning goal. I mean, that's that's not on yeah, him at all. That's... Ian, Ian Cole puts it into his own net. I mean, if you're looking for one stinky goal in this game, it's probably Vancouver's third goal. Zadorov down off the rush. The exact same goal he scored earlier against Nashville, short side high right. against Stuart Skinner. While Skinner's we're on the goaltender, yeah, Skinner's got to stop the, the uh, Zadorov shot for sure. But I think. You know, goaltending, I don't think necessarily swayed this game in either direction. I think it was, you know, the play of the order's top end guys for sure. Got a little more physical too, hey? Like yeah. temperature went up, yep. nastiness went up a little bit, and there were some missed calls. And there were missed calls in both directions, for sure. Farhan, yep. for sure. But 
McDavid got lucky. Flat out, that would have been a massive swing, a double minor, and it should have been. Yeah, it should have been. I mean, he gets his stick up, and the referee wound up showing himself up because then a couple seconds later, you know, in the final seconds of the period when Vancouver was on the power play, he had to kick him off the ice. Yeah, he had to kick him off the he ice. Was bleeding because he was bleeding from the call that they missed. So you, miss, you missed that call, and to get McDavid off the ice for four minutes, the way he was going, would have been just as valuable as the Canucks okay. going on the power play. And Rick Talker was asked about officiating after the game, and so was Quinn Hughes, and they weren't really biting on those moments. Uh, I think the one thing that, you know, and there was one early in the game where there was a, a Darnell Nurse check delivered to, to um, Pedersen. Pedersen behind the net. I didn't think that check was bad, right? He didn't hit him in the back of the numbers. I didn't think that was boarding, but two seconds later, the he elbowed him to elbow. the back of the head. <laughs> Follow-up but, elbow. But later on for me, you know, or not for me, but for Rick Tockett, his concern was the slew foots, and there was some of that, Evander Kane, yep, or Corey sure. Perry on Hughes, so he didn't like that. I'm sure if you're Chris Knobloch, you, you're probably feeling the same the other way, but we wanted we wanted some emotion to get involved in here and some hate here, and it's, it's starting to get that way. Yeah, for sure, and, and I think both teams are pretty comfortable in that situation. I think they all handled it pretty well. Um, there was a little more chirping after the whistle, a little more animosity. Derek Ryan with just a not a smart penalty that ended up, uh, you know, definitely costing him a little bit there. So the temperature went up here farhand. It shifts back to Edmonton. I don't know. How do you think the Canucks are feeling about a split at home? How do you think they're feeling about the way it went in game one? You know, they grabbed that win, but they were dominated in this game by the other big guys. How do you think they're processing that? Well, I think if you're the Canucks, you go back to game one because they were clearly the better team. I know in Edmonton, they're going to say, oh, we were up 4-1, but didn't necessarily deserve to be up 4-1 in that moment. And the Canucks should feel that in the second and third period, we tilted the ice and were capable of that. If you're Edmonton, you came into this series knowing you were heavy favorites. And, you know, people were talking about a four or five game series win for Edmonton. And I guess five games is still possible. If you were the Canucks, you knew you were going to need to go a long series to win this series, that it was going to go 6-6 seven games so I think you can live in this world you lost game two at home against Nashville uh, you came back and did some good things and look the Canucks 3-0 and on the road in these playoffs it's been a beautiful few days here in Vancouver I have to say sunshine every single day yeah. but it was 28 degrees in Edmonton today Love so you're it. coming back I to coming. I think the weather's going to be decent Do you have a pool at your place in I, Sherwood I Park don't. I got a hot tub we'll, uh, we'll barbecue in a hot tub and fantastic game three and four uh, coming up